So welcome everyone uh, to the McLean lecture series. Um, uh, we're so excited that you joined us. We had a wonderful session with Dr. Street just uh, prior to this with the students and residents and some faculty and um, the ethics fellows are gonna join us at the end. Um, but we are at the beginning of our spring quarter for the gender equity uh, lecture series. And um, we have a number of upcoming talks including Dr. Pringle Miller, who's also um, uh, alumni of the university, works here in the city on uh, justice, and um, she'll be speaking next week. The week following that is a panel of um, our women surgeons who will be talking about the state of gender equity in surgery, um, and then a number of other presentations on Wednesdays following that. So I encourage those of you um, who might be interested to join us, but I'm really excited to have Dr. Carl Street joining us today. I'm going to introduce him and then let him get started on his talk. Um, Dr. Street is an assistant professor in the Boston University School of Medicine. Um, and he wrote this, not me, but after being a nerd at the University of Chicago <laughs> and attending med school and residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, he completed fellowship in general internal medicine at Brigham and Women's. Nationally, he has chaired the American Medical Association's Advisory Committee on LGBTQ issues, served on the board of GLAMA, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equity Equality, and currently serves as the president-elect of the U.S. Professional Association for Transgender Health. Carl's efforts to improve the health and well-being of sexual and gender minority individuals and communities have earned him several awards, notably from the University of Chicago and Johns Hopkins University Alumni Associations and also the American Medical, Associ American Medical Association Foundation, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and recognition from the Obama White House. As the research lead for the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery at the Boston Medical Center, he collaborates with researchers, clinicians, and staff to assess and address health and well-being of transgender and, diver and gender diverse individuals. So welcome, Dr. Street. Thank you everybody for that uh, warm welcome. And we'll go ahead and jump right in. Some things about me uh, that we shared earlier. I'm an introvert, so giving talks for me is a unique form of stress. So I, that means I will be talking quickly. I'll probably be gesticulating, gesticulating wildly with my hands and such. The goal is to make sure there's plenty of time for questions at the end as well. So as you heard, uh, we're a number of hats within Boston University's Trebenian uh, and Avedisian School of Medicine. We actually recently renamed our Center for Trans Medicine and Surgery to the Gender Care Center to provide a more holistic view. Again, we're not just about medicine and surgery, we're really trying to, to care for the whole person and a number of other roles. Um, basic disclosures, you heard about a number of things. I do carry still a number of uh, leadership positions within organizations that are dedicated to broadly LGBTQ health and particularly trans and uh, gender non-binary health as well. Grants that help me do research around these health issues as well, and then fortunate to have some consulting roles, none of which are directly related to this material. Um, I do normally like to start with a land acknowledgement. Normally I'd be coming to you from Boston, land of the uh, city land of the Massachusetts tribe. We are now in Chicago, which is actually part of the Potawatomi and Peoria tribes, as well as additional tribes. But unfortunately I do not have my notes to remember off the top of my head, but there are six concurrent tribes that actually um, uh, this land is originally theirs. I bring this up because a lot of the work that I do is around social justice and equity. And I think some of the first steps we really have to do is acknowledge past wrongs to really begin to redress them. Colonization has harmed not only indigenous populations, but has continued to actually harm broadly everybody, um, particularly LGBTQ individuals and particularly people as it relates to gender since our binary focus around gender is actually a Western and colonial concept. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into the history of that. There are extensive books and uh, work around this. Um, I'm a big fan biased uh, by work for Dr. Jen Mannion out of Amherst who has written about female husbands, the existence of additional categories in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I'm a big fan of uh, Jules Peterson from Hopkins who has talked about the existence and documentation of trans identified youth across cultures and history. So again, I wanna highlight that recognizing uh, colonization is a really big first step in addressing a lot of uh, wrongs in, in the world. Um, particularly here. So some basics. Um, I saw Dr. Sonoy Paul's uh, great uh, lecture. I wanted to just share a little bit about my own background since there are a few trainees here. I'm from around Chicago. Um, if I wasn't here in Chicago, I would say I'm from Chicago, but um, I'm actually from Zion, which is a small, very conservative religious town just north of here. Um, I chose to then fortunately come to the University of Chicago where I was in fact a nerd. I was very focused on a PhD career. I was thinking about doing proteomics. I was really uh, focusing on Alzheimer's uh, research. 
Um, and once I did some of that work during the summer, I realized that is not what I wanted to do. Um, I was fortunate to be part of, um, at that time, the, the course still exists. It's always changing every year, it seems. But I got, um, I had a social professor, Dr. Holly Swires, who I always joke uh, ruined my science career. She was the one who really kind of helped me think about a more holistic view of patient and community, community well-being. Um, and essentially, I started volunteering at a number of organizations, notably uh, the Howard Brown Health Center. They had the Broadway Youth Center, and I actually started volunteering um, while in undergrad and afterwards um, to do STI testing and counseling and so forth. And I got to see firsthand how people could actually be very engaged in community work um, and providing direct clinical care. So that really kind of got, uh, got me excited about thinking about a career in medicine. Took two years between med school um, and undergrad. I also, while working at Howard Brown, also worked at Sidetrack. Those, for those who are familiar, Sidetrack is the largest gay bar in Chicago, one of the oldest gay bars in Chicago. Um, I had a great time there because, um, not only because fun being a young gay man working at a gay bar, um, but having to see the ways in which business could actually change politics. The owners of, of Sidetrack are very involved in uh, the uh, political landscape in Illinois and Chicago in particular. They are the founders of Equality Illinois. One of their main focuses was naturally uh, civil unions, marriage equality early on, but they've expanded beyond that, thankfully. Um, and they made sure that any company that wanted to work with them had to be supportive in some way. So any alcohol company that wanted to be featured uh, within their bar had to actually donate to LGBTQ initiatives as well. So for me, that was a unique uh, experience to see how as troubling as capitalism is, capitalism can actually be used to try and help the community as well. Um, yep, so that's me as a bouncer way back when. The gentleman next to me is John Finolio, who is now actually a news anchor in California. So Sidetrack has been a unique launching pad for a lot of folks. Um, I then eventually got uh, back into school, uh, chose to go uh, to Johns Hopkins on the East Coast. It was hard to leave Chicago, but Johns Hopkins was an awesome opportunity. But there I learned that, like I think many folks have experienced, that LGBTQ health is not often part of the curriculum. Um, and I really started getting involved in more national organizations, including the American Medical Association, as well as GLAMA, historically known as the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, but it's so much more than gay, lesbian, or medical at this point. It is multidisciplinary, it is all identities, um, and really focused on trying to improve the experience of healthcare professionals and trainees across the board, as well as the, uh, the care uh, needs of our patients. Stayed at uh, Johns Hopkins for my internal medicine res uh, residency training at Johns Hopkins Bayview. We always joke it's the kinder, gentler Hopkins. It's not the Oster program, uh, but so they have a primary care track, uh, which was an awesome way for me to actually engage in more uh, long-term care, as well as having a program that was essentially said, Carl Slongs, it's not illegal. You can do whatever you want. And they essentially allowed me to get a certificate program at George, uh, at George Washington University in LGBTQ health policy. So a lot of uh, opportunities during training when I asked for it, which was really helpful. Um, and then essentially uh, chose to go on to get additional training in research methods, uh, went to Brigham and Women's as part of the General Internal Medicine Fellowship. Um, they paid for my master's in public health. I always encourage you to have somebody else pay for your education at some point. Um, I, I eventually decided I, I cannot take on any more debt, and I was very fortunate to be able to have them do this so that I could get additional research skills to use research to inform policy, which is a, a, through, a, a theme through a lot of my training. And you'll see some of that as we go forward. So that's kind of like the easy trajectory of my life. Of course, none of this was at all what I planned when I came, uh, when I first came to University of Chicago. Even when I was in medical school, I had no idea that I was going to be doing a career focused in LGBTQ health. It's just something I kind of fell into, I feel, because nobody, I didn't really see a whole lot of folks in my training experience doing it or doing it well, or in fact being harmful. And maybe during the Q&A when there's no recording, we can talk about different history of different institutions and their role in being helpful or harmful to LGBTQ health uh, issues. So I was fortunate to join Boston University. They had already established at that time their Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery, now their Gender Care Center. Um, and uh, the current director had moved on to Mount Sinai in New York to start the same center, Dr. Josh Safer. Um, and Dr. Um, Jenny Siegel uh, took over as the medical side of it, and they wanted somebody to come in and do research. So for me, this was like a win-win. I was able to just move right across the street um, and got to work with some amazing, have continued to work with amazing folks. So I'm gonna put this all up here just to spare us the ridiculous animations. This is kind of how I view a lot of the work that I do um, in terms of addressing data uh, gaps uh, in population surveys around sexual orientation, gender identity, looking particularly at trans and gender non-binary individuals, but also looking at community resilience factors uh, that really strengthen and protect us from some of the harms in society, and then really trying to incorporate more intersectional methods to understand the experiences of multiple marginalized individuals. Policy, a big part of that is really trying to get more data collection uh, that includes sexual orientation, gender identity. We were even talking about it earlier in terms of how it relates to trainee data collection as well. 
Um, we talked about how faculty earlier on um, do not know as much about these topics as we'd like. So I'm a big fan of actually seeing if we can get continuing medical education requirements for certification for existing faculty and, and clinicians moving forward. And then of course, non-exclusion issues within insurance. Um, I do a lot of different education initiatives, both of course in the didactic realm of writing textbooks and doing lectures and so forth, but also making sure trainees uh, rotate uh, through clinic with me. And then my particular interests are around primary care outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, which we'll focus on today, but also trying to understand how we can better prevent cancers. And be, uh, again, uh, one of the trainees mentioned this very uh, presciently in terms of uh, we are too gendered in the ways we approach a lot of issues, particularly around cancer. So um, that's another area uh, we're working on. And then um, as a, an academic, we always have to churn out a lot of different papers. So naturally, I do write a lot of different opinion pieces with other colleagues to really try and make sure people are talking about LGBTQ health very broadly and recognizing that this is not something unique to primary care or internal medicine, that it is something that can be addressed across multiple specialties from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, and I included some fun slides in terms of uh, this is not all just work that I do in clinic, not all just work in the office. Um, I uh, have had a lot of fun getting to meet uh, other like-minded folks within the American Medical Association. The AMA has a sordid history, both good and bad, around a variety of issues, particularly around race, ethnicity, particularly around LGBTQ issues. Um, thankfully, over the past few years, we've been able to pass a number of policies, and they've done a really good job of trying to redress, again, their wrongs in the past by calling them out and uh, moving forward. So this is me working with our uh, ambassador steering committee, which is uh, really trying to help with messaging around LGBTQ issues. This is again, us taking over sidetrack, um, where if you if you mention my name, you might still get a free drink. Um, this is us uh, passing out an award within our state society. So Massachusetts Medical Society is part of the AMA. Um, it's a standalone uh, state society. You have your Illinois State Medical Association as well. Um, and we have an LGBTQ focused committee within our state society. Um, and this is us uh, providing a wonderful award to Dr. Yvonne, uh, Yvonne gomez Carrion, who is a gynecologist who has been instrumental in providing gender affirming surgical care for trans masculine individuals. Um, oddly enough, some of the strange stuff as a fellow is getting invited to Baku, Azerbaijan to talk about gender issues. Um, so again, recognizing that this work can be highlighted. Um, this is the Point Foundation, which is I encourage medical students or other, if there's any undergrads who are listening or watching to look at this uh, foundation, which provides scholarship to trainees who are LGBTQ or do work in LGBTQ issues um, and provides a wonderful source of mentorship. It's been a wonderful uh, joy for me to be part of this. Um, and then naturally making sure that you speak up whenever you can. Uh, this was at an Atlantic event where one of the speakers was talking about how trans issues are in vogue and that trans identities are a new feature of modern society. And I naturally had to speak up after having read a few books um, and doing the work that I do, um, uh, which is always awkward as an introvert. And then also having fun with uh, friends doing charity work. So this is a uh, charity bike ride uh, originally in Maryland, uh, still in Maryland. I had done the ride for AIDS here in Illinois as well, which starts in Chicago, goes all the way up to Wisconsin and back. So I encourage you to find ways to be uh, have, find joy in this work. Um, and then naturally the AMA giving us opportunities to highlight amazing folks such as uh, Admiral uh, Rachel Levine. Oh, and then working at ABC News, which was a weird experience, something you as residents have the opportunity to look into, uh, where there is a month-long rotation at ABC, New uh, ABC News, where you are essentially their medical voice, um, and you are the ones vetting research, providing stories and such. When I was there, we made sure that we talked about trans youth issues as part of um, uh, Dr. then Richard Bessert's uh, Twitter chat, essentially. So. And then lastly, this was uh, when I was uh, honored uh, from the Obama White House, so uh, Vice President Biden. And as I mentioned, the American Medical Association is trying to redress its wrongs. It has created a new health equity center. They have a new fellowship focused around uh, anti-racism in particular. This is something that I'm part of, and these are some of our other fellows, all of whom are uh, dedicated to uh, the intersectional issues around LGBTQ health as well. Um, and then lastly, just personal, um, this is my husband, and this was coming up on four years ago when it snowed in April here on campus. We got married here at UChicago. Um, so again, I didn't do this by myself. Um, I don't think anybody does this kind of work by themselves. Chad has been very, um, very understanding and I've had many amazing mentors who've helped me along the way, so. But let's talk about non-binary issues, getting beyond binaries uh, and so forth. I'm a big fan of using some cartoons. Um, I think this is always fun where we always are told men are from Mars, women are from Venus and yada yada, we're on earth. We are not as binary. I talked a little bit briefly about the historical context but I want to uh, focus specifically as it relates to cardiovascular health and some other issues in internal medicine about how binaries have really um, missed the mark for us. So 
the CME related objectives. Briefly, I'll talk about terminology. Won't be any testing after this. These are just key concepts. We'll talk about some unique disparities in cardiovascular health for trans um, and uh, gender uh, non-binary folks. And then we'll talk about some opportunities to improve research and clinical care. I'm a wonderful, I'm a big fan of the NIH's Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office definition of sexual and gender minority populations. It can be boiled down, this paragraph can be boiled down to anybody who is not cis het, uh, who is not cisgender, who is not heterosexual. Um, and because it works very well to make sure that we are not only focusing on strictly lesbian, gay, bi, trans individuals, that we are really trying to have a more expansive definition. It really calls out specifically the inclusion of intersex and people born with differences in sex development. It also acknowledges the different uh, additional identities that have historically been erased, again, from colonization. So two-spirit and other addi uh, additional indigenous identities as it relates to sex and gender. Um, love, again, different graphics that move beyond binaries. This is a form of the uh, gendered unicorn um, that I like using because it doesn't have masculine versus feminine. It doesn't have male versus female and so forth. It really tries to acknowledge that you can be on these different spectra concurrently. You can have significant components of masculinity and, and femininity and so forth, as well as additional categories that are, are moving beyond our Western concepts. We're gonna focus mainly around gender identity and gender expression. So gender identity, I don't think anybody in the crowd uh, doesn't know this, but just for those who are listening in, gender identity is your internal sense of self as it relates to your gender. Um, again, these are a lot of socially and culturally derived categories. Um, so again, recognizing that this can change depending on where your uh, patient or where your community is actually hailing from. And then gender expression more broadly is the social and cultural cues that people physically use to, uh, to essentially signal their gender identity. And again, making sure that people recognize you don't make assumptions about somebody's gender identity based on their gender expression. Um, and I'm always, I, I like using uh, the example from uh, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Actually, a few years ago, uh, Trevor Noah had on Jacob Tobiah, who's a non-binary activist, author, um, actor, um, who essentially wanted to try and help Trevor Noah uh, queer uh, his gender, essentially. Uh, provided Trevor Noah with an earring saying, you're going to try this on, I want you to be a little bit more feminine. Trevor Noah puts it, clips on the earring, says he doesn't like clip on earrings, but he'll do it for, for his guests. And it says, this is wonderful. My, gra my grandmother would be so proud because where I come from in South Africa, from my grandmother's tribe, this is actually masculine. And my grandmother would be very happy to see that I'm wearing this. So again, recognizing that there are different cultural cues as it relates to gender expression. So again, overall, don't make assumptions about your patients or the community you're caring for just based on where you're coming from. So it's always worth asking people about this. So basic demographics uh, in terms of where we're going, um, I get a kick out of the Gallup uh, survey. They haven't done this question in a while, but essentially just your best guess, what percent of Americans today would you say are gay or lesbian? Um, last time they had checked in 2015, essentially nearly uh, people thought on average a quarter of the US population, adult population was lesbian or gay by itself. Um, I always get a uh, kick out of that. I wonder which neighborhood they live in. I'd like to move there, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but the reality is still optimistic uh, in terms of uh, the increasing trend and in people feeling comfortable identifying as lesbian, gay, bi, trans, or an additional identity beyond heterosexual or cisgender. So we're at 7.2% of the adult population feeling comfortable answering a phone survey saying that, yes, they are one of these identities. Um, I always encourage, remind people that this is probably an underestimate because somebody's calling you, asking you, are you gay or lesbian, straight, like, and, so, and so on and so forth. I don't know if I would feel comfortable answering that question depending on who's calling. Um, there's a lot of national surveys that do this. I honestly think there's fluctuations year by year, depending on who's in the administration or which state is actually calling and asking these questions. So I do like Gallup because Gallup typically has a little bit more brand recognition, is a little bit more nationally trusted. So 7.2%, we're talking about overall 20 million adults who identify broadly as a sexual or gender minority uh, individual. Wonderful breakdown by generation. Again, this is where a lot of uh, not helpful people, um, I would say, think there is a trend or contagion, uh, but I would argue that uh, there's been great research from the Williams Institute, their generation study, which uh, had uh, a few publications about five, six years ago now at this point. And what they had done is look at different generations and when people actually came out, when did they feel comfortable coming out? So looking at three generations starting 18 to 25, oldest being 52 to 59 that they surveyed. And you can see that for around sexual orientation, people tended to group around the same age for when they recognize that they had same sex attraction. So understanding that internal sense of self, but it's when you start incorporating that identity, start coming out with that identity is where you start seeing a spread across generations. So even having sexual debut, already an age difference there between youngest generation being at 16 on average, older generation being closer to essentially early adulthood at 19. 
self-identifying, incorporating that identity into who you are, young, a younger generation on average 14, so still more than likely living at home, up to 18, so already on the way out for the older generation, and then coming out to a family member, still living at home with the youngest generation, typically all the way up to established young adult at 26. So I always point to this information when people say, oh, it's just a trend and so forth. I'm like, yes, it's a trend in terms of how people feel comfortable coming out and how they actually have connection to community and how they actually have family support and families are recognizing this more and more. There is research ideally coming out soon from, the trans, from their trans-focused survey called TransPOP, which will also be able to look at this generation question um, moving forward. So that's just the fast and dirty of some of the terminology, some of the key concepts and some of the um, epidemiology. But let's talk about cardiovascular health. So why focus on cardiovascular health? I feel like for a lot of our internal medicine colleagues and pretty much for everyone, you recognize that cardiovascular disease is still one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the US and in the worldwide. Um, it has a number of factors that we can intervene upon, which is always exciting that we as doctors can actually do something to help somebody feel better um, and live longer. So cardiovascular health for me has been um, a major uh, interest uh, as long as I've been interested in medicine. Um, but I would say a key turning point was during residency. So I, um, during what, second year, going into third year of residency, I was on my uh, cardiology rotation. One of my attendings, Dr. Monica Mukherjee, um, who was amazing, who was an awesome ally, essentially said, Carl, I have this patient, I have no idea what to expect. I don't know what the research shows. They are a 70 year old individual assigned male at birth. Um, they're a long standing patient of mine. They have diastolic heart failure um, and they are beginning estrogen therapy as part of their uh, gender affirming care, as part of essentially being uh, a trans woman. What can we expect for this patient? She is an expert in diastolic heart failure. She's an expert in terms of different effects as it relates to uh, 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 cardiac function and output and so forth. But she knew that there were differences based on the literature around sex but what does it mean for, for a trans individual who may be beginning hormone therapy? Are the hormones a key factor of this? And that kind of led us uh, to ask a number of questions. What do we know about cardiovascular health for trans folks? And uh, what we do know at that time was very little. Um, what are some of the unique factors that, are, that trans folks face? And we've actually expanded this uh, broadly to uh, all LGBTQ folks. And then what can we do to provide better preventive health care? And this actually really launched my current career was this one interaction with uh, a, an early ment uh, mentor about trying to understand what's happening for a patient in front of me. And this is actually how I do a lot of my research is making sure that there's a patient story that actually grounds it because I'm not a fan of research for the sake of doing research. It needs to actually make sense and has to come from a patient perspective. And ideally a patient, we've gotten better about this, actually patients telling us, this is what I wanna know. How can I help you as a researcher figure it out? So. The CDC has started to recognize unique factors that affect cardiovascular health. Um, they have used this circular model, which I'm not the biggest fan of and will critique as we go forward, talking about recognizing how stress and anxiety actually affect cardiovascular health and various factors affecting cardiovascular health, uh, leading to heart attack and stroke and so forth. And that some of that can actually feed back and cause depression and anxiety and can be uh, particularly not helpful. A lot of the research was focused in veterans and as well as cisgender women and additional racial and ethnic minor, um, marginalized populations, but nothing looking at other marginalized populations such as LGBTQ or particularly trans folks. Dr. Billy Caceres and I expanded the existing minority stress model um, uh, as part of our American Heart Association statement to get out of this cycle of saying, it's, oh, it's just stress and anxiety and it moves forward to card causing cardiovascular disease. What is upstream that causes stress and anxiety? What's further upstream that may be causing a number of factors that lead to uh, uh, poorer uh, coping mechanisms as it relates to cardiovascular disease? So kind of pause here to focus around the minority stress model. Minority stress model posits that your internalized identity can be protective. You can have access to community factors. You can recognize that you have strength as an individual, but that society will interact with you based on that identity or even on that perceived identity. And it will cause a number of unique stressors, particularly as it relates to discrimination, violence, um, uh, and so forth in terms of rejection. And that can start as early as childhood because the family can often be the first place the people experience uh, discrimination as it relates to sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, and that a lot of this can get internalized and lead to internalized homophobia, transphobia, hypervigilance, always being on guard. And that those factors lead to a number of issues that affect cardiovascular health. We already talked briefly about anxiety and stress and depression. Experiences of discrimination and unique stressors has already been very well tied to that, and that those have been tied to a variety of factors as it relates to cardiovascular health. What has been more uh, uh, further explored um, of late is trying to understand how experiences of discrimination maybe tie into poor coping mechanisms. So why do we smoke more? Why do we drink more? 
Um, but then where we're trying to really uh, piece apart some of these issues is what actually happens with discrimination when it gets internalized? Is there a physiologic response and is that physiologic response sustained? Um, we're starting to see early research that looks at the experience of marginalized populations, particularly racial and ethnic marginalized populations, and how this essentially um, is causing increased not only cortisol, but cortisol over the long term, which is affecting issues around heart rate reactivity, affecting issues around hypertension, insulin resistance, and so forth. This research is now being redone, looking specifically at LGBTQ folks. So this is the model I want people to think about when you're seeing a patient in front of you. Yes, they may be somebody who is smoking. Why are they smoking? Yes, they may be somebody who has high blood pressure. Why do they have high blood pressure? You really have to explore some of the additional factors upstream for them and ideally connect them to additional resources that may be beneficial. Having community support, saying you have community support is actually protective as it relates to hypertension. So key factors that we like to intervene upon, I think folks are very familiar. Of course, we can uh, treat blood pressure. We can treat diabetes. We can get people on preventive uh, uh, medications such as aspirin and statins. We can encourage people to work out and so forth. But how does this actually play out for our trans patients? Um, and wisely um, of late, which I always get a kick out of telling trainees that sleep is important. I can't, I think I sat through at least three lectures as a resident in morning report, half asleep, like, oh, sleep quality is really important. I'm just like, that's not happening right now. Um, but sleep quality is a critical new addition to the American Heart Association's uh, view of ideal cardiovascular health. So naturally a healthy diet, physical activity, glycemic control. Um, they focus on BMI, I say excess weight. Um, we're looking at lipids, looking at blood pressure, smoking cessation, and better sleep. So we'll look at each of these uh, factors as it relates to trans individuals. I think there's always been a lot of good research and uh, a great campaign to really remind us that broadly LGBTQ folks do smoke more than the general population. Um, I think I always have to remind I, I always have to remind people again the history of this. Where could we find community? Where could we be safe? They were in bars. When I first started working at Sidetrack, it was still a smoking bar, and like that was awful. <laughs> but you're around folks and you're in, you're essentially getting these triggers to maybe engage in smoking, smoking behavior. You're stressed. Society, you had a bad experience at work, bad experience at, um, um, in any parts of what was going on at the time. Tobacco and the tobacco industry knew this. The tobacco industry has been, we have evidence of this, has targeted marginalized populations. This is the case as it relates to racial and ethnic marginalized populations, particularly around menthol. We know that menthol has also been used to target LGBTQ youth uh, overall. So again, this is why we may in fact be uh, smoking a little bit more. What's interesting here is again, there's more research. Some of this um, done by uh, Dr. Phoenix Matthews uh, uh, based here in Chicago that shows that experiences of discrimination for trans individuals has been tied to a higher likelihood of reporting smoking and that more discrimination is actually associated with dual smoking. So actually smoking and using e-cigarettes. What the flip side is, is that some research has shown that when people be engage in gender affirming care, they actually smoke less. They feel a little bit more comfortable about themselves and they actually, uh, uh, qualitative research has shown that they actually want to take care of their bodies now, now that their bodies are more in alignment with what they want uh, what they want and what they feel it should be. They actually, val they actually feel like, oh, this is my body. I need to take care of it. It's finally where I need it to be. Physical activity, um, there's, this is an area that is ripe for more research as it relates to adults. We have a lot of research for trans youth and adolescents, um, particularly from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, which is a, a survey of high school age youth in a number of states and a number of large uh, school districts, including Chicago School District. Um, what this found was that the experience and recall discrimi uh, discrimination for youth led to less physical activity for particularly trans individuals. But what we found in other subsequent surveys is that, again, engaging in gender affirming care led to people wanting to actually work out more or engage in some sort of sport. Um, I think this is particularly prescient as it relates to issues with how state legislatures are banning access to sports and community uh, opportunities through sports for trans youth as well. So again, physical activity, not great for trans individuals overall. BMI. I'm not a big fan of BMI as a metric of health. There's a lot of issues uh, that we won't go into here, but um, I always, again, point out excess weight. Is your weight in any way uh, getting in the way of what you want to do physically or any other parts of your life? And what we have found for trans individuals overall is that there is a higher likelihood of them reporting a, um, a excess weight, essentially. This is based on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is the largest and oldest surveillance system of its kind in the U.S. It's a survey of all states through their state uh, health departments, as well as the ter uh, our offshore territories. And what that has found is that trans individuals essentially on um, overall have a, a BMI, my apologies, a BMI over 25, uh, about three quarters of the time versus the general cisgender population being two thirds of the time. 
Uh, there's also been some research looking at what are the effects of hormone therapy as it relates to um, excess weight. We've seen that testosterone actually affects lean weight. We don't know what that means in terms of actual BMI um, for, uh, for transmasculine individuals receiving testosterone. And the obverse has been seen for, for folks who are receiving estrogen therapy where lean mass will decrease, uh, but their BMI, BMI may stay the same. Diet, again, opportunities for more research here. A lot of the work that we have, um, a lot of the data we have at this point is focused on youth and adolescents. Essentially, not having a healthy nutrition, being uh, engaging in um, essentially uh, unhealthy eating behavior as well, in terms of trying to manage their body shape and uh, body conformity. So we're seeing more binging, binging behavior, more eating disorders among trans uh, and gender non-binary adolescents and youth, based on the survey data so far. And then, lastly, uh, one of the last ones: glycemic uh, control. So. This is where more research has been done focused around hormone therapy. So the effects of testosterone have been tied to possible increases in insulin resistance, but it has never been followed long enough to say, do those people have then diabetes as a result? Um, I'm not a big fan of saying that's actually what we're probably gonna find. More than likely, uh, we'll actually just see that they have insulin resistance, that there's no effect in their actual um, overall cardiometabolic health as it relates to insulin, but a few other factors I'll talk about that testosterone seems to have a stronger effect on that I'm worried about. For estrogen, we're not seeing a whole lot of change in terms of insulin resistance or not. So testosterone is not the most helpful for this. So lipids are where we have the most data for trans individuals, especially as it relates to hormone therapy. Testosterone um, does not help lipid profiles in general. We've seen this particularly in cisgender men who are uh, hypogonadal. What this essentially leads to is lower HDL, higher LDL, and higher triglycerides. But again, nobody has ever tied that to long-term outcomes. What's actually happening as a result of testosterone for cardiovascular um, health in the long-term? As a primary care doctor, great, we'll continue testosterone because this is actually helping you with regards to a number of other factors as it relates to your gender affirmation. And if and when you need a statin, we will provide you a statin. That's the only thing that I would recommend at this point. For estrogens, we are seeing the opposite now. So estrogens actually are improving HDL, actually um, lowering LDL. So we're but nobody again has tied that to better outcomes for trans individuals receiving estrogen therapy just yet. And then uh, last one, one main traditional factors, uh, hypertension. A lot of mixed data out there. Estrogens, um, particularly progestins, seem to show lower uh, blood pressure. So actually reduce the rate at which we see hypertension in trans individuals. This is based on a lot of electronic health record data from a, a number of pooled uh, cohorts. We're seeing mixed results for testosterone, where testosterone may increase systolic blood pressure by, uh, on average, three to five uh, millimeters of mercury. What does that mean for somebody actually having hypertension? We're not exactly sure in terms of the clinical significance of that, but we are seeing it consistently uh, across the board. And then lastly, sleep. So this is one of the newer areas of research that the American Heart Association wants us to focus on. Some of the earliest uh, studies around the experience of sleep quality for trans individuals was done by Dr. Billy Caceres out of Columbia, who was again, one of the leads on the AHA's statement on broadly LGBTQ cardiovascular health. And what uh, his group found is that poor sleep quality was associated with recalled experiences of discrimination, particularly as it re related to somebody's gender. And that accessing gender affirming care, particularly over the long term, led to people actually reporting better sleep quality. So again, gender affirming care, reductions in discrimination are a way to actually help people's health. So it's not just strictly what we can do in the clinic, but what can we do within a community setting as well. So additional risk factors, I've covered all the essential eight that the American Heart Association wants us to fo uh, focus on, but, there's other factors that we agreed upon as a group of cardiologists um, and neurologists that really should be talked about as it relates to potentially hormone, hormone effects. So testosterone affects endothelial function, um, uh, particularly as it relates to decreasing essentially the ability of our arteries to dilate. So leading to arterial stiffness potentially at an earlier age. This has not been tied to any kind of heart attack or stroke, but it is a factor that uh, essentially our, uh, I would describe more of our bench research scientists are trying to better characterize and understand is there, is there an additional intervention we should think about in the future to protect um, our, uh, arterial uh, stiffness or relax, uh, the ability to relax? Estrogens have the opposite effect, actually improving elasticity and reducing um, our arterial stiffness for trans feminine individuals receiving estrogens. Talked about tobacco, alcohol. I'm, I, I honestly think this is more of a political uh, thing in terms of alcohol not being wrapped into the American Heart Association's guidelines because alcohol has not really helped a lot as it relates to cardiovascular health. Um, I think this will be something that comes up in the next few years and being a focus of what we need to do. We already do that in primary care in terms of talking about um, excess alcohol use. And again, all the research has shown that access to gender affirming care leads to reductions in alcohol consumption. 
uh, pe uh, people again are within qualitative studies saying, I wanna take care of my body now. And so this is why people are reducing alcohol. But also again, community connectivity has also led to reduce reductions in alcohol. But again, the bigger problem is how are we targeted as a community? Um, you can always see during pride parades, I remember all of the different alcohol companies being out, out front supporting us and making sure that we had a good quote unquote good time. So just be mindful of the community effects of this. And then lastly, um, HIV by itself is a cardiovascular uh, risk issue. A lot of the earlier medications have been an issue. Our trans populations have an un, uh, undue uh, excess burden of HIV. So another factor to keep in mind moving forward. So, but this is where I want us to think about uh, really beyond some binary issues. These are the tools that we use as primary care doctors, as cardiologists to try and uh, prevent any kind of uh, a heart attack or stroke. But we know that these categories suck. Um, we know that the race ethnicity category has been awful. Um, and thankfully work from, for example, like the multi-ethnic uh, study of atherosclerosis, the MESA study and Jackson Heart study have really tried to expand these categories and say, these are not helpful uh, when we're really trying to predict who's at risk. We may be under or over uh, estimating people's risk for cardiovascular disease and therefore either providing them an intervention they don't need, potentially exposing them to harms of statin or withholding a medication that they would actually benefit from. What is actually happening for our trans individuals when we are using only a, uh, a binary category around sex, male and female? Um, I would argue that what would be helpful here is actually really trying to expand, if we think there's an effect difference around hormones, we should maybe include some sort of measure of hormones or some sort of hormone status. Because we know, for example, for cisgender women who go through menopause at an earlier age, they have earlier cardiovascular disease. We know that for cisgender men who have some form of andro andropause or hypogonadism, they also have cardiovascular disease issues. This calculator doesn't take that into account at all for our cisgender individuals as well. So it's for, I always like to say that when we focus on marginalized populations, particularly the work that I do around trans health, we actually learn ways we can do better for everyone. So this is where we need to get beyond binaries because cardiovascular health research, and I even joked about this when I was in residency because every time I was in the cardiac uh, critical care unit, I had to know five studies off the top of my head at all times for any kind of intervention because they collect so much data. Cardiology is one of those very evidence-based, which I appreciate kind of specialties, but they're collecting data in binary categories and we are missing opportunities to really expand on this. Um, we've highlighted this actually just, this literally just got published a few days ago um, with uh, work from Dr. Tonya Petit, who is now based at, moving from UNC to Duke. Um, I'm covered up here. I'm the senior author here, oddly enough, uh, where we really wanted to highlight what's going on for trans individuals when we use these risk calculations. So this, these are just the basic demographics of the Light Plus study, which is a, a study, a, a prospective longitudinal study of transgender women, um, trans feminine individuals who are uh, Latina or black um, and who live with HIV. Really trying to understand a number of health issues. We were focusing on this for this paper on cardiovascular disease. This is the, the basic demographic characteristics of our population, who's ever received hormone therapy uh, as a uh, gender affirming hormone therapy, who's receiving treatment for uh, HIV. Um, a number of the key traditional risk factors as part of the risk estimation scores, including uh, blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, uh, uh, lipid profile, diabetes, and so on and so forth, and who's getting treatment for some of these characteristics as well. And then a very simple table that we really are trying to drive home the message. If we use their sex assigned at birth, which is all male, uh, we should be providing statins to over a third of this population. If we do it strictly based on their gender identity, it drops down to 18%. And if we do it based on who's receiving feminizing hormone therapy, it's 22%. Who should be getting testosterone? Who should be getting statins at this point? And we do not have enough evidence to say what should change in clinical practice, but I feel there's enough evidence to say there is a very large gray area for our trans patients. Um, I, as a result of these kind of uh, of these kind of studies, and even when I'm with a patient who is at an age where we really need to be thinking about cardiovascular prevention, um, they may have one or two risk factors. We have a, a very much as best we can informed decision uh, discussion where I'm waving my hand saying, this is what the evidence kind of shows, and this is what I think we could do. And this should really be a, a discussion about, do you have a family history? Are, they, are there any other risk factors that are not taken into consideration in the risk estimation tool that may tip you over to maybe need, needing a statin? Or no, are you, you just happen to have high blood pressure um, and of an age and your lipids are just right on the edge, but you're, you're getting back into a workout routine, you're really engaged in, in not smoking and drinking anymore moving forward, maybe we'll hold back on statins. So there's a lot of nuance around this. And this is just the beginning data that we wanna show that for. So let's talk about what can we do better? So 
Dr. Lauren Beach, who's at Northwestern, um, is also an amazing uh, cardiovascular researcher, epidemiologist, um, particularly focused on broadly LGBTQ health issues and the experiences of marginalization and how that relates to that. Um, we've had very close in R01 trying to look at the experience of marginalization within the Framingham Heart Study, but sometimes you just don't get there, but we're, we're trying. So we, we were invited to uh, write a commentary um, uh, for circulation, looking at the ways in which cardiology can do better, trying to move beyond this binary category um, overall. And we one of the one of the reviewer comments was uh, was concerned that we were picking on cardiology, um, and I, I we were that was like the that was like the language, and I I was like I get it I understand we are being very focused on cardiology it's circulation that's what we're supposed to do, but again it's as I mentioned earlier cardiology is just one of those very data rich specialties, and I were picking on it because you're the, you have, actually have the opportunity to do the most good moving forward because you have all these mechanisms mechanisms in place. But it's not just cardiology, we've already talked about this, uh, but for example, it's kidney, it's nephrologist. They use, they use gender, male, female, when they're trying to calculate the EGFR. Um, they have thankfully updated as it relates to race, ethnicity in terms of removing that and updating their calculations. But when we still have a binary category around male, female, what are we doing here? We know that this is not gonna be great because it's really trying to understand how should they be accounting for creatinine in uh, essentially uh, uh, blood urea, nitrogen, and so forth. How should they be accounting for that based on assumptions for body composition for male and female? But we know that that actually changes for trans individuals as it relates to hormone therapy over the long term. So what's actually happening with their lean mass? How should this calculator be taking that into consideration? And this calculator then actually feeds into the MELD score <laughs> in terms of actually what else is going on. So, and we have, you'll see there's a, a few papers coming out as it relates to what can nephrology do in the future? Um, a number of um, uh, hepatologists actually based here at University of Chicago are trying to update the MELD score to um, ensure that not only um, cisgender women actually benefit from it because they've oft often actually been lower categorizations in terms of liver transplants, but making sure that trans people are actually explicitly included in the calculations moving forward. So we picked on cardiology a lot, but it's not strictly cardiology. Um, and then again, talking about alcohol, it, the audit C is still men versus women, what's actually going on here? Why do we think there is an, a difference between here? We know that alcohol, there's a big issue in terms of it's actually being water soluble and like which body composition actually has more water. So should we be using body composition rather than making assumptions based on somebody's uh, sex and so forth? So there are so many other tools, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they have binary categorizations that lead to clinical decisions that may benefit or harm people. So we've had, we're currently fortunate to have an administration that's really on board with trying to improve broadly LGBTQ health, uh, particularly trans health. Um, this is just uh, addressing a number of issues as it relates to discrimination around sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, we've also had the wonderful National Academies of Science, Engineering, um, and uh, Medicine, including guidance on how to collect better data around sexual orientation, gender identity, how to get beyond binary categories, and so forth. Um, we can at a later date, we can definitely critique um, how this rec these recommendations can be operationalized. At minimum, they are a start and they are a national message that everybody should be doing this moving forward. Um, and there are many, many, many publications uh, that Dr. Uh, Beach has kindly uh, consolidated. This is just a small sampling that really get at the messaging around collecting sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, as clinicians um, uh, and as somebody who goes around giving these talks and trying to convince people to do this uh, better data collection, I'm sure there was issues here in terms of trying to get SOGI included within EPIC was that, oh, people are gonna, patients are gonna be offended by us asking that question. We're gonna scare away people. This is early data from the Fenway Health Institute, which is like Howard Brown in Boston, um, uh, in terms of what is the experience of outpatient uh, patients um, across the country. They looked at four geographic uh, different outpatient settings and what they found was that the vast majority, essentially above 85 to 90%, and this was back in the uh, early 2010s, everybody essentially understood why these questions need to be asked. They understood that when the clinical reasoning was given, they were like, oh yeah, absolutely, you should have that information to uh, inform some of these decisions. And they had no issues uh, with regards to sharing that information with their clinician when it was appropriate. This is outpatient. Uh, work done at Hopkins and Brigham Women's looked at this in the emergency room setting. So again, across a number of demographic cat uh, categorizations, you see the number of people choosing not to refuse to answer the question around sexual orientation being much higher um, than those who refuse across any uh, number of factors, even highlighting across age. Naturally, you see a younger generation more comfortable answering questions around sexual orientation, gender identity, clocking in at around 93.5% saying they would not refuse, but it's still above 85 for those over 80. So people are comfortable answering these questions. What they um, what this group had done 
uh, from their study had actually then done surveys with the clinicians at these centers, clinicians were overwhelmingly way more uncomfortable asking the question than the patients were uh, answering them. So we have to get over our own discomfort. And some of that could be a, a factor or reflection of how we're trained like this. Oh, it's very sensitive. Like this is just a, you only have to do it in only certain such situations and so forth. And that's even assuming you're trained to ask the questions uh, with broad categories. So I think we need to do better about our training and our own internal issues around sexual sexuality and gender identity. So, and then in national surveys, so this is old data at this point, but it's, we've seen similar trends moving forward. This is just looking at Washington State's behavioral risk factor surveillance data. This is wonderful work by Dr. Fredrickson Goldson, who's one of the leaders in older LGBTQ adult research. And she essentially looked at, based on different age categories, the rate of refusing to answer a sexual orientation question. You see it dropping down to like 1%, less than 2% for older generations. And what's unique is that people are more likely to not tell you their income. They will refuse to tell you their income rather than they will refuse to tell you their sexual orientation. So much higher odds here of uh, refusing to answer how much money somebody makes, which goes to show how a capitalist society doesn't want, doesn't want us to share our, our incomes. So, um, But there's a lot of uh, great guidance out there at this point in terms of how to incorporate sexual orientation, gender identity questions into electronic health records. Um, and it is no longer something that you can choose to do. It's something you have to do moving forward. Um, there's uh, essentially guidance from the United States core data for interoperability, as well as our meaningful uses um, regulations that essentially electronic health records have to have the tools and they all do at this point. We now have to use them. We have to flip the switch from saying it's just there in the background to actually collecting that information. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. This is gratuitous. That's one of my publications. Um, but there are there's a lot of guidance in terms of how to make sure you roll this out, not just to turn on the sexual orientation, gender identity data fields, but how to prepare your healthcare system to respectfully ask those questions to make sure patients can volunteer that information when they want to. They can control over who sees that information. And I think this is especially important for adolescent individuals who may, for good reason, want to share that information with their clinician, but their parent may be somebody who's actually on their, for example, their Epic My Chart, who can see that uh, data. So how do you make sure there's a safeguard between, guard, between uh, essentially patient who is getting increasing autonomy, is protected by law to have that autonomy to make sure that something doesn't happen with, uh, with the parent or guardian? Um, a lot of other guidance out there for how we can do this better in research. Um, but also I wanna make sure that we do this better um, with community led work. So this is the 2015 US uh, trans survey. They just got done doing the 2022 and they're cleaning the data right now. This is one of the largest studies of trans health in the US with over 27,000 respondents. Um, they have not shared the number for what the 2022 year um, uh, cohort is. They said it is larger, which is amazing. Um, and this is all trans led. And this is how a lot of research, community research should be done. It should be, we should be providing the tools um, and really supporting folks um, who are living the experience to understand what's going on, what's meaningful uh, research questions for them. Um, and I'm a big fan of the All of Us study, which has broad categories around sexual orientation and gender identity. They've been very explicit about that. And that's because they actually directly partnered with the All of Us study, uh, which is a PCORI, uh, not the All of Us, sorry, I just said that, is part of the uh, uh, part of the PRIDE study, which is the uh, largest longitudinal study of LGBTQ health. It's part of, funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, housed at Stanford now. Um, and they are essentially the LGBTQ experts for the All of Us study. And that's how it should be. Community folks should be the ones informing this data collection. Um, and that means we need to understand what does our community want to know um, with regards to um, how to ask these questions? What do they want to know in terms of their uh, to their health and health issues? A lot of great research. Again, community members essentially doing qualitative work to understand what's the best way to do this. Um, and then for those who are thinking about doing any kind of research projects, um, and I may have scared you off saying there's not a whole lot of great research sources out there. There are. There are dozens of national surveys out there that collect some component of sexual orientation or gender identity. There's only a handful that collect both and probably one or two that do it fairly well. But I'm a big fan of using the CMS uh, Clearinghouse, where if you want to just think about projects, look at this, happy to talk about it more. But this is one of my go-to places where I have a question. I wonder which data set can try and answer that uh, and really go at, uh, go at what, uh, what needs to be done for our uh, patients. So broad recommendations, naturally, I want to make sure that we are including sexual orientation, gender identity in any research moving forward, um, making sure that it, it makes sense for the research question at hand, and that if you are for any reason saying collecting sex, why are you collecting sex and why are you only using binary categories? Um, we've really tried to push on a lot of uh, uh, different research studies. I uh, co-chair an institutional review board in Boston as well, and I've been really trying to push for folks like your research question has no reason to know, need this information 
And if you feel like there is something a priori that's going on, why are you using only binary categories? And that's often how we try to get a little bit of expansion on the research projects. We should be including more measures around behavioral health and experiences of discrimination. That's something we have not been typically trained to do in clinical research um, or clinical care. And we should be partnering with our community to actually measure um, these factors over time. Um, and in terms of more research that's coming forward, just this week, the uh, National Institutes of Health, Sexual and Gender Minority Research or, uh, uh, Office uh, essentially put together a workshop um, and we've reported out. Um, I was one of the members of their older adults uh, workshop to really try and understand what is gonna be needed, uh, what do we need to know for trans folks moving forward? And the biggest one that we, I think we was able to plug for is that we have to get beyond binary categories and we have to find ways of using the tools we have now, how do we shoehorn them to better serve trans folks? And then how do we make sure that all tools moving forward do not have binary categorization that leaves people out? And that if we have a question that we think is some sort of assumption around sex assigned at birth, what factor of sex assigned at birth are we really questioning here? And then we should maybe be measuring that. So there's uh, guidance out there. Um, this is led by the WCG IRB, one of the largest national IRBs um, in the US. Um, they've wonder, been wonderful partners in terms of making sure that LGBTQIA plus folks are incorporated into a lot of the research studies moving forward. So again, we need our oversight committees to be doing this. Um, I and Dr. McNair also then published this within the Society for General Internal Medicine's publication, the forum, to provide guidance for how to do this uh, for researchers. Um, again, lots of great resources out there. I'm not going to belabor the point. We'll make sure we have time for Q&A. Uh, but then in terms of clinical practice, I've been alluding to this overall. Yes, I want to make sure we have the data collected up front. I think the sooner you can allow patients to do that themselves, the better. They're always more comfortable doing it from their home if they feel comfortable in terms of being tech savvy or at least having some sort of privacy around it. But also, again, are still comfortable answering those questions when the clinician will ask it as part of a standard intake. Um, I want you to make sure that we are incorporating this into your training. Um, it's been great to meet a lot of the trainees here, um, uh, present here in the room, and then also a few folks um, uh, over the years that are making sure this is part of your experience, but I know it is not necessarily standardized. And I know that sometimes what's standardized is also negative. So trying to find ways to make sure that we are incorporating this in a positive way. Um, and that again requires that we as faculty have to go to some trainings. We have to really try and be a little bit more upfront about um, how can we do better and be prepared to train folks. Um, I, as I mentioned, I cannot do it alone. I don't do it alone. And a lot of us have to really partner and essentially share resources. Um, again, there's more guidance on how to do this in academia. I'm going to leave this for, you can check out later, but all the different modalities by which we can improve training um, as it relates to LGBTQ issues across uh, undergraduate, graduate medical education, and continuing medical education for faculty. Um, you'll have access to these slides as well, um, and this is also in a publication, so don't worry. <laughs> um, and that's it. So again, it's all about community. Um, and a lot of this work has come out of our American Heart Association statement on trans uh, cardiovascular health. This is the working group that Dr. Beach and I uh, uh, pulled together. Again, a lot of the folks I've mentioned before uh, with experience in cardiovascular health and well as transgender and gender diverse health. So you can see a lot of folks uh, from across the country. It's been great. So leave it there. Right. So um, any questions in the audience? Dr. Paul, and I'll repeat the question so the people on Zoom and then Zoom people, if you'd like to type it in the q and I'll read out your questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. Let me just repeat. Yeah. So the question is twofold. It has to do with um, when Dr. Street gives this talk around the country um, and people ask questions about the politicization of this topic. How do you deal with it? And then also, how do you, um, I think, manage kind of the current yeah. political state? Yeah, good questions. Difficult questions um, in terms of, so I actually have a, a, an old slide that I've taken out because the, the data has not been updated <clears throat> that shows that 
Um, it's based on the census data. It looks at same-sex households, and they are in every county in the U.S. There are same-sex households everywhere in the count in the U.S. And one that there are issues with that data. It doesn't tell us about trans folks. It doesn't tell us about bi folks who may be in opposite sex relationships um, uh, for the census. But it does show us that typically we are we are everywhere. And when I've given this talk um, in different parts of the country that stereotypically may be seen as more conservative, and I maybe hear from the audience, oh, this is great. So glad you did this. I don't have any patients like that. I'm like, patients are either coming to you and you don't know it, or they know not to come to you. Um, and I think as clinicians, we we kind of are one of our main oaths is we are supposed to care for everyone. And that's um, at minimum, you are supposed to put aside any judgment and care for everyone. Um, on the more political side of it, which it is getting, I think, more toxic, um, is that I really try to appeal to sense, which doesn't exist, but I really just point out that they are coming at this from political ideology. I'm like, so if you think this is all things that are in vogue, please provide the evidence that supports your opinion, or tell me what kind of evidence you would need to change your mind. Because if you're being honest about saying that you're open-minded and you're just asking questions and are trying to make sure you understand things, tell me what kind of information do you need to actually change your mind? And honestly, I normally get people fumbling over that because like, oh, they can't, because anything that they ask for, I can provide. Because there's always, there's all the research already out there saying we've been around forever. Um, gender affirming care is not a new thing. Um, and that the increase in the number of folks who self-identify is an increase in the people who self-identify, not the number of people who actually are that over the years. So I, I always try to push back and say, tell me what you want to know to potentially change your mind. And if you can't change your mind, that is where political ideology is really uh, is really rooted, unfortunately. Um, and this has come up even in some uh, reviews of articles that I've published with, with colleagues and such where we are lacking objectivity because we are part of some of the uh, communities we're writing about. There is no way to, to disengage from that. And the, the expectation that you are not part of the population you're studying somehow lends up objectivity is, 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 is I, it's just like, in my mind, a form of white supremacy. It is a form of colonization. This expectation that just because you're not part of it, you are somehow more objective doesn't make sense to me um, and has never borne out in a lot of the sciences at this point. Um, the second question, what do I do? So I, <clears throat> one of the um, one of the trans leaders um, in Boston uh, shared a quote from a book, and I always forget the book. I wish I could remember the book, um, where she says, uh, the way a choir holds a note indefinitely is that you have a group of people singing the note and everybody takes a breath when they need to take a breath and everybody else is carrying the note when the other person's taking a breath. And that's kind of what I have to do at this point. Um, I, I, I've, I've never gone into this thinking, I, it's only me alone. And I, that would be very egocentric. And, I, and I, there are people in our movement, unfortunately, who are a little egocentric who need to maybe take a step back and take a breath. Uh, but on days when I need to, I take a breath. Even when I still have to give a lecture, I will tell people like trainees and such, if you need a break, take a break. This is being recorded. You can watch this later. Um, I don't I don't force that too much. Um, but I'm also extremely privileged at this point. I am economically comfortable, which is such a cheesy way of saying I have enough money. <laughs> um, my husband and I are married. We are in a state that protects uh, protects that and has provided additional protections around that. We are, uh, we are cisgender, I'm white. Um, like we have a lot of privilege already in that. So it's one of those things we have to acknowledge, um, I, which means that when I do take a break um, or if I'm able to carry, or what, actually when I'm able to carry the load of, of that, I check in on my friends more, so. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Aurora. So I'll just repeat yeah. it quickly, and that is that um, we talked about this in our earlier group too, and sometimes our students, our trainees are more educated than our faculty, and how do we um, educate not only faculty who are allies and interested, but also faculty who are, you know, off doing other things, but also need to be educated. If I had the answer to that, I'd be, I'd be set. Um, we, 
so one there there's an undue burden on trainees to do this work um I, I really enjoyed doing it as a student and as, as a resident and such, but I did recognize that I was not getting as much as I could as a learner because I was the one doing a lot of the teaching, um, which, but again, gives builds confidence, gets you to become quote unquote a leader or what, what have you, there are benefits still. But the flip side being, I am a big proponent of trying to change requirements because um, I, I used to joke, I was raised Catholic, I believe in having a, like, you need to, like, you need to do this <laughs> um, in terms of, I would like uh, licensures um, for new and renewals to have some sort of training around LGBTQ health issues. The problem being um, no specialty society, no uh, state society will support that. Um, organized medicine is a guild. A guild doesn't like to be regulated. Um, I totally get that as somebody who's part of these organizations. I see that, that tendency to want to push back. Um, I would argue that it's going to happen anyways. DC is one of the first jurisdictions to require that anybody with a DC uh, licensure has some sort of training around LGBTQ health issues. Um, they are a model and their city council passed it and made the board do it. Um, we've had similar situations in Massachusetts where the state has actually mandated that um, all clinicians and uh, folks uh, getting licensure and renewals have to get training on Alzheimer's disease and care. That makes sense for me as an internal medicine doctor, but because our state society wouldn't engage and was fighting them, our pediatric colleagues now have to learn about Alzheimer's disease and how it relates to their patient population. So there are unintended consequences if you don't play along. So I, that's one way I, I think is going to get the broadest reach. Um, institutions need to incentivize this work in some way. Um, I do a lot of this work for free, essentially. A lot of uh, its trainees are doing it for free. A lot of our faculty are doing it for free. Um, there has to be some sort of carve out potentially for broadly equity work, because I'm not a fan of necessarily picking apart each identity group, just saying equity, and we include all of this in the umbrella when we talk about equity, and that's what it should be. Um, and ideally, we should be uh, focusing on multiple marginalized populations. A lot of this research, even LGBTQ health, still has an overwhelming race uh, racism issue in terms of being overwhelmingly white. Um, and it, only recently is that really being called out. Yep. Yes, in the back. So I'll just repeat quickly, one of our pediatricians um, was talking about capturing sex assigned at birth and then uh, sexual identity, gender identity, and how do we do it better um, as a medical? Yeah, yeah within, so I'm not a pediatrician, and I always want to defer to the, the AAP and uh, additional organizations that are thinking about this more explicitly and are being very, I think, cognizant of a, a number of factors in terms of how to safely collect this information, what does it mean at young ages and so forth. Um, there's always questions even around sexual orientation for adolescents, how that should be documented. For younger for younger individuals and particularly in clinical trials, it's still important to collect sex assigned at birth. I think we just need to make sure we have enough categories, particularly if there are individuals born with differences in sex development and what those specifically are. The gender identity component, I think, is a question for how is it related to the research or the particular outcomes for the, for the child and for the family. Um, Again, we know that a variety of stressors, unique stressors and general stressors that people face affect their outcomes. And it may be, it, I think it's important to be able to collect that information and look at differences um, over time. And other thing to keep in mind, which is a little bit harder sometimes to, to get researchers on board with is that recognize that your data will be used at some point in a meta-analysis. And it is helpful to include additional demographic characteristics to think about potential questions that you may not be thinking about in the future, so long as that data can be protected and potentially updated if there's any ways in which a youth may want to be able to update their gender identity over time as well. Um, I think one thing to recognize is, as I mentioned um, early in the presentation, the differences in generations in terms of pretty much everybody at the same time recognizes they are lesbian, gay, or bi, but how they come out changes over generations. Um, the TransPOP study from the Williams Institute has the data to be able to look at. Nobody's looked at that yet. There, the 2015 U.S. Trans Survey has a publication recently 
um, led by uh, Dr. Jack Turbin out of UCSF, one of the leaders in, in trans youth research, um, showing that again, there is not a big difference in terms of the age at which people recognize that identity, but the age at which people come out still is what's changing across generations. Um, I liked their paper. The graphic wasn't as pretty as the one that the Williams Institute did, which is why I didn't include it because it was not as intuitive, but we're essentially seeing that very similar trends that we are seeing more trans youth because it's something that they can have words for and talk about. But for, on the research side of things, collect the data that is most pertinent for the research question and then anticipate potential uh, additional questions down the road. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so just the quick re repeating is like, how often do you um, encounter barriers to um, paying for gender affirming care? Every day. <laughs> um, I mean, literally this morning, I was like trying to address a prior authorization for um, a uh, testosterone patch because I personally believe that patients should have preference for how they obtain their medications. Whereas a lot of insurers are like, oh, everybody should be started on injectable testosterone. But it's like, that is not what everybody wants. That is not how it should work. Um, so every day is is me battling, and that's and that's not just for my trans patients, but it is particularly for my trans patients. Um, in terms of what we try and do in Massachusetts, is that we are engaged with a number of the payers. We they have uh, advisory group for our Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, our own healthcare system is a very large ACO as well, so we've trying to make sure that that insurance plan is up to date. But I think as you saw on the news, there are plenty of insurance plans that just outright deny claims without even looking at the claim itself. So this for me is a larger, much larger system issue where um, I, I would like to think that single payer is an option, although I'm always worried about who's in charge of that single payer system, since we've seen fluctuations in how Medicare and Medicaid provide coverage depending on who's in charge as well. Um, but we are also trying to push and get CMS to have a new um, Oh, why am I totally forgetting on their declaration of coverage, their specific terminology for providing uh, coverage for gender affirming surgeries. So that's hopefully gonna get updated soon. But yeah, every every day, but it is not unique to gender affirming care. All right, so I think with that, we will, um, these are comments, so yeah. we can read these comments, but I don't think they're, they're qu not questions for you. Okay. Um, so we will stop the recording. Thank you to Renana for recording it. Um, and we will um, give Dr. Reed uh, one last uh, round of applause for a street, sorry. <laughs> And then, um, and then we'll ask our ethics fellows to come down and join us in the front for the final kind of conversation. So thank, thank you, you again. Yeah.